compound eyes with a stereoscopic vision of a dragonfly. Long antennas with tactile sensitivity of a lobster. Walking and swimming legs of a shrimp. Retractable thorax of a pill bug. And shelter under spiked armor. This is the trilobite, the most important animal in the Paleozoic era. From Greek we get the number 3, 3, areas or zones, lobes, three zones, trilobites. This may be misinterpreted because its body is also divided into three parts. The head is known as the cephalon and it has various shapes. You can see the eyes here, the crescentic eyes. The midsection is the thorax, and it can vary. There could be many, many segments in the thorax, or just a few. The agnostics only have two. Some of the other ones get up to, into the 30s and 40s. Um, in this case, we have a pagidium, as they all do, the tail. And the tail can have on at the end of it a spine, which sticks out. And it could be used for positioning the trilobite uh, securely in the mud while he springs at his Pray. That's the thinking of many people. Trilobites have a whole series of legs down the, uh, the, the body of the animal. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that um, one of the features that trilobites have is antennae, that's the first pair of appendages, um, and one trilobite at least has antennae at the back as the last pair of appendages, or circe as they're called, antenniform circe. Um, but between the appendages at the front and those at the back, if they're present, um, there are a series of appendages right the way down every segment under the body. And these are what are called biramous appendages. And they're called biramous, the bi being two, of course, because the leg has two branches. It has a walking leg that's called the endopod, um, which is used for what it did, walked uh, and dug um, and um, made those trace fossils. Um, but then it has a branch above that that's called the exopod that has filamentous fibers uh, that, uh, that run um, that probably were used in respiration um, and probably also uh, gave the trilobite propulsive force when it was swimming. So um, those, that uh, uh, branch or ramy of the biramous appendage is called the exopod and it is generally known as the swimming leg. So there's a walking leg and a swimming leg. So you can imagine that swimming leg might be used uh, for swimming because with all those filaments it's quite broad and it presents a lot of surface area against the water and therefore could be used to push uh, the water away uh, and therefore used in, in swimming. For vertebrate beings like us, the most important animals from the past were the dinosaurs. Ancient beasts that took their body plants to extreme. In the invertebrate world, trilobites are the most important animals of the past, since they diversified to their maximal potential. By doing this, they brought their bodies to radical transformations. This is Ketnorapsis. Um which is a particularly intriguing trilobite. It's got a lot of spines, spines of different shapes. And we believe that this trilobite um, would hunch up its back uh, using these, um, these spikes at the back of the pygidium to anchor it into the sediment and then use its, long, its, uh, its legs to stir up the sediment to, to free uh, organisms that are burrowing into the sediment. And then using these very short spines at the front as kind of a rake to entrap uh, any animals that it disturbs in the sediment. These long spines on the side of the thorax here were probably acting as protection while this trilobite was in a very vulnerable um, uh, habit. The big question is, 
Where do all the trilobites come from? To discover the origin of trilobites, we have to make reference to this animal, Parvancorina. It has come from the Ediacarian period, long before the Cambrian. It has similarities in its dorsal morphology. Um, Parvancorina, you know, has this basic division into head and trunk and a segmented trunk. And it may be that in Parvancorina, I forget right now, what, but it may be that this pattern of anamorphic growth of adding segments is, is established in that, in, in that too. But does that mean that Parvancorina is the, um, the, the ancestor of, uh, of trilobites? Um, I think that that is a much uh, more open question. Um, the trouble with these Ediacaran organisms um, is that, um, that they, they offer very few characters that we can um, assess uh, with confidence in terms of their homology or shared evolutionary ancestry with trilobites. Although its identity is unknown, visually we can say that the ancestor of the trilobites had to increase segments to achieve its classic design. Compared to the contemporary groups of arthropods, the body design of trilobites is old, but it already had the same evolutionary trends. Isn't the size of Ada Sotelus rex comparable to any giant erypterid? Is not this a cephalon in the tadpole shrimp? Aren't these plural spines in the female of Platyrodrillus foliaceus? Aren't these plural spines in the larva of Paleodictyopterida? And even more, in its adult stage, are not these wings structures analogous to the plural spines? According to the fossil record, the four evolutionary trends are increase and fusion of segments, change in vertical and horizontal size, modification of body parts, increase and decrease in size. The trilobites had the potential to evolve in the same ways as their relatives to occupy the same habitats. Let us take the species Crotalocephalina and Emuloidea. They follow the tendency to add segments to their shield and length their bodies vertically. If we use the imagination a bit, any of them would have the potential to evolve into an animal similar to the Carboniferous Arthropleura. In general terms, the, um, the evolution of trilobites follows a pattern of increasing uh, specialization through time. So a lot of the early Cambrian trilobites are fairly um, uh, Unornate, you might say, uh, they lack the spinosity um, and uh, particularly sophisticated uh, visionary organs. And as we move through time, particularly into the uh, Devonian, uh, we see a lot of spinosity, uh, also elongation of the pygidium, um, specialization of the uh, cephalon, uh, enlargement of the eyes. So the question is about these, these trilobites that have the very long eye stalks. We obviously don't know what their, what their lifestyle, what their habitat was. We can assume, I think, that they were probably burrowers. They were probably underneath the sand, and the eye stalks rose above the sand and uh, gave them a field of vision while they were burrowed and, and safely protected. There, there's some crustaceans, um, there's a lot of other animals that do that today too, uh, specifically uh, mole crabs, a lot of burrowing crabs that will have their eyes on stalks so that they can live underneath the sand and yet their eyes are above the sand giving them a view of what's, of what's coming. Probably the trilobites with those long eyes had, had some kind of lifestyle that was similar to those living crustaceans. So what we're looking at here is a member of the isopoda in the family Cerolidae. 
and these are fascinating because they look so much like like the extinct trilobites. They even have the, the body from side to side in, in sort of the three lobes, and they have a, a telson, which looks a lot like the pygidium of the trilobites, and the eyes look a lot like the trilobite eyes. Uh, they are not trilobites, they're crustaceans, and we know that because of the two pairs of antennae and the mandibles and the shape of the legs, uh, and genetically, the molecular evidence shows that they are crustaceans. Uh, but it's amazing uh, and a very good example of convergent evolution that this group of crustaceans looks a lot like, like the extinct trilobites. These are mostly burrowers, and uh, presumably, they are, that's what the ancient trilobites were like too. So uh, I'm going to put this one down, this one with all the spines, and pick up another one now that is another Cirola that doesn't have spines. Okay, so this is another isopod uh, in that same family, the Cirola. Just showing the remarkable similarity of the living isopods to the extinct trilobites, even though they are not believed to be closely related. They're very, very similar in form, and we assume probably in habitat. These, these isopods are also uh, burrowers in the sand uh, and swimmers. Currently, there is nothing more related to the trilobites than the horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs are often thought to be a um, the closest modern relative of trilobites. Um, Certainly they have a very long fossil record uh, going back to the, the late Ordovician. There are a couple of examples of, of Devonian horseshoe crabs, quite large from the time. They were never particularly diverse. Um, one of the most significant occurrences of horseshoe crabs from the Maison Creek, they're often preserved in nodules like these, this is uh, called Europs, uh, quite small. But with many of the, the features that we recognize uh, in common with modern horseshoe crabs. They belong to the Chelicerata phylum, which means the pincer carrier in Latin. This phylum includes the extinct Eurypterids, sea scorpions, and also the current arachnids. There are many differences between the horseshoe crab and the arachnids. It could be said that horseshoe crab is an intermediate stage between an Eurypterid and an arachnid. An Eurypterid has three segments in its body, while the horseshoe crab has only two, like in a spider. The phylum Chelicerata is first cousin with the phylum Trilobita. These two phyla belong to a larger group of arthropods, called Arachnomorpha. While the similarities of these two groups are not obvious, they become more visible when we observe the more primitive representatives of Chelicerata. The representatives of Arachnomorpha are defined by having a spine in the part of the tail. Also, eyes that penetrate the surface of the helmet, legs for each segment of the thorax, and the most important feature that differentiates them from the other phyla such as crustacea or myriapods, is the lack of mandibula. Sanctacaris, that appear to have similarities with trilobites, does not leave the same in the fossil record. The only thing left from Sanctacaris are translucent impressions that leave a lot of space to speculation. Unlike, the bodies of trilobites are preserved with ample detail. They incorporated minerals to their exoskeleton, calcium carbonate to their armor, and silicon dioxide are the key to be hard as a bone. As a member of Arachnomorpha, the eyes of the trilobites that were located above the helmet gave them high angle of vision. The high viewing angle was very important. The trilobites fed on marine worms, digging and grinding them with their legs before entering their mouths. We don't really know too much about how trilobites actually captured and manipulated the food that they, uh, that they must have ingested. We know that their um, endopods, um, which are the, we call the walking legs, um, had uh, projections on the insides um, that maybe were involved in scraping and macerating food particles, so breaking them up. Um, we understand that 
uh, the legs move these food particles in towards the central cavity that runs down the middle of the trilobite. And we know that the mouth of the trilobite was under the head region, but directed posteriorly so that it met the bases of the legs. So that as the legs moved um, backwards, you can imagine my arms as, as the legs, my thumbs as the, the point for rotation, um, as, the, as the, 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 um, the anchor of the limb. Look at, as I move my legs back, look at what happens to my knuckles. As we rotate around my thumb, my knuckles move forward. And the knuckles are the central parts of the leg um, down that uh, axis, that groove down the middle. And um, the, the knuckles, uh, my knuckles, if they were trilobite-like, would have spines on. And those spines move together and they grind material, passing it up this food canal or food passage um, towards the backwardly facing uh, mouth. But while this happened, all their attention was centered under the sand. This left their dorsal part exposed to predators. One of them was Anomalocaris, the first super predator in history. Anomalocaris could visualize the trilobites from above and then catch them with their feeding appendages. So we have here a um, feeding appendage of Anomalocaris. Um, this is one of just a couple specimens from California um, found in the uh, White and New Mountains, uh, Northern California, and uh, from the Carrara Formation. Um, so, although it's not terrifically preserved, it's quite significant in being one of just a couple known from the state, uh, and has been studied by uh, experts on the normal carrots in order to understand the taxonomic variability and uh, the global distribution. A trilobite with high viewing angle could spot it and hide under the sand until the danger passes. How were the eyes of the trilobites? Unlike the compound eyes of insects, the eyes of the trilobites were crystalline silica lenses. The glass lenses gave them minimal distortion and multiple depth of image. A trilobite could determine the distance and time of arrival of an anomalocaris. Those seconds were the difference between life and death. Until these days, those lenses are preserved as a memory that the world would never have better lenses than this. With no doubt, these innovations gave them an advantage that their rivals did not have. For trilobites, the more eyes the better. That's why when we find the fossils, it's very likely to see a large group of them. In this way, survival is facilitated. They had activities that put them at risk. When they molted, their bodies became vulnerable for a few days. One of the ways in which trilobites were able to molt was to throw themselves in reverse and have their spines catch on to a, a matrix or a rise, a piece of rock or part of a hillside, and the spines kicked the headpiece forward and it came off. The sapling popped off and then they were able to crawl out of the body shell. So that's how they got rid of the exoskeleton. There are other ways too, but this is one of the frequently used ways. Another problem is reproduction. At the time of mating, their defenses became low, putting them at risk of being ambushed. For that reason, it was easier to live in communities. Perhaps, within these communities, there was a visual language that could be only understood among them. Were these really defenses against predators? Or maybe, they were part of a message that they wanted to transmit to another trilobite. 
So horns on many different kinds of animals, whether it's uh, horned mammals or even the trilobites that have the really crazy uh, spine configuration, um, evolve probably through a number of different ways. Sometimes they might start out as a defensive structure or maybe a display structure, but through natural selection, you can get situations where they may go in just really crazy shapes um, that have no really easily testable function. You don't necessarily need to talk about these things as either or. Um, there could be, you know, multiple elements, and any organism um, uh, is experiencing all sorts of different selection of pressures um, that may have effects on um, on its uh, on its uh, on its body form. Um, so, um, uh, with regards to defense, um, uh, it's interesting that this spiny trilobite and other odontofluorids like it. Um, have a very characteristic pattern of enrollment. We've talked about enrollment. Um, and there are many trilobites, uh, phacopids and proetids, for example, that when they enroll, they form an encapsulated sphere, um, like, a, uh, like a, a soccer ball um, or cricket ball or something, or even baseball, um, that is an, a, it's spherical in form. Um, but when odontoplorids enroll, they don't enroll in that manner. They form, uh, when they enroll, they form a cylinder. And you know what a cylinder, how it differs from uh, a sphere, uh, the cylinder is open at the, at the ends. And that's true for odontoplorids. Um, but that uh, open uh, aperture, when the uh, trilobite enrolls, is protected by these spines that project out when the animal is enrolled in all sorts of directions, 360 degrees of spines pointing out. One of the things about odontoplurids is that on their uh, thoracic segments, they don't just have one spine, they have two spines. That's one of the things that makes the odontoplurids the odontoplurids. And so spinosity um, in this situation of, uh, of cylindrical enrollment is a, a characteristic feature of these, uh, these animals. And I, I, I suspect, therefore, that there is some selective advantage in having symmetrical enrollment, sorry, cylindrical enrollment. Um, maybe it allows water to get into the uh, appendages, the gills, when the animal is enrolled. But there is a protective function of those spines. So I do think that those spines probably had a protective function. The other thing, of course, is you know that it, it is a, uh, a sexually um, uh, a secondary sexual characteristic that is advertising. Um, the, uh, the animal to potential mates, um, and that this kind of spinosity may be, uh, may be part of that. Um, and it's certainly true that trilobites um, uh, had social behavior. Um, we don't know a lot about trilobite reproduction, um, but we do know that there are certain times when trilobites cluster to, together, uh, and these clusters don't seem to be just the result of the uh, uh, of uh, currents on the seafloor, they seem to be the result of biological aggregations. Trilobites appear to have a degree of intelligence. This intelligence is compatible to today's animals, implying that trilobites were ahead of their time. The oldest specimens were found in the North American Craton. The Burgess shells that in the Cambrian period were located on the coast of Laurentia contain fossils of trilobites of the order Rudlichida from the so-called Cambrian explosion. Till the end of the Ordovician radiation, the trilobites thrilled until they reached their limit in species diversity. Is in this period Ordovician that all the orders of trilobites appeared, agnostida, blind miniatures with an open shell body. Asaphida, smooth surfaces with sutures in the middle. Ticoparida, the most similar to the original trilobites. Harpetida, harp shaped head. 
Proetida Oval body without many projections Facopida Large eyes and rolling body Likida Tail with the shape of a fan Odontoplorida Body covered with spines Corinexochida Glabella that reaches the edge of the head Only the first order, red liquida, is lost. Perhaps one of the most uh, intriguing things about trilobites, now that they're extinct, is trying to interpret what their ecology was, uh, the way in which they uh, fed. Uh, and uh, how they interacted with other organisms. Um, being extinct, we can't easily observe them today. All we have left is the fossil record. Um, it's believed that trilobites uh, utilized almost all of the um, ecological lifestyles of modern arthropods. So that includes being predators, uh, scavengers, and uh, filter feeders. In addition to reproducing in large amounts, they inhabited all marine floors, adapting their eyes to each level of luminosity, so they could get food from everywhere. I think the diversity of trilobite um, lifestyles and, and, and uh, body plans seen in the, in the first figure, the first question, you know, uh, speaks to something of the diversity of what these animals were doing. And I think um, uh, there were uh, clearly some animals that were living uh, at the sediment water interface, some burrowing down and, and some off the sediment water interface. It's clear that there were some trilobites that were living not at the bottom but uh, in the water column, either at the top or at, um, at, at some depth within the water column, but not actually on the seafloor itself. So there were clearly a variety of different ways in which trilobites made their living. The amount of well-preserved fossils is so great that paleontologists locate the earth layers by the presence of trilobites and the trilobite species is used as a parameter of time. Trilobites that would be index fossils, uh, and there aren't a, a, a specific group of trilobites that are that way in North America. Many of the type of pards would be index fossils. They would uh, relate the, um, the Cambrian Ordovician subdivisions, stages. Um, in Europe, the trilobite oranus. Uh, that's in the upper Cambrian. That's used widely as a uh, index fossil in Russia and Britain because it's so widespread and had a definite time range. And there's so many species of it. Uh, in North America, a lot of the Cambrian fossils in Utah occur in other places, so a person could possibly use those middle Cambrian trilobites for index fossils. In the Ordovician, life became harder. Ostracoderms jealous fish and eurypterids, sea scorpions, appear to compete with trilobites for the same food and habitats. It is possible that eurypterids and cephalopods hunted trilobites, but this is not for sure, since the content of the intestines are not found in the fossils. Uh, I had occasion in the field in Cole County, Oklahoma, with some friends we were fossil collecting, and the outcrops were Devonian, the Sonic Cattle Ranch. 
and we saw on the ground the, the midsection, that is the thorax, and the tail, the pygidium of a trilobite. And when I flipped the, the specimen over, there was a, a, a nautiloid, and it was at a 45 degree angle, and immediately it was obvious that it was predation. The thing came at it suddenly, and he and apparently turned it over or just hit it point blank on its underside. And you can see where it had scarfed up the uh, soft parts of the trilobite. It was at, a, at an angle such that it was a real attack. And this is kind of how trilobites went out of style because the fish and cephalopods were efficient predators. What we can say is that trilobites survived and diversified. And to do so, they had to build weapons in their exoskeleton, hide under the sand, and when there was no other alternative, go up into a bowl. There are about 20, 25,000 different species of isopods on the planet, so it's a very successful, very diverse group today. A lot of those roll, like some of the trilobites roll, and we assume that's, a, that's for protection. Those who could not do so were beaten. Despite this, this was the golden age for the trilobites. They were the best adapted and most experienced of their time. I would tend to agree with Carlos that the Ordovician is more of the, end of the golden age of trilobites. The reason is that the great diversity and diversity of form. A lot of the Cambrian trilobites belong to the Tychopards and they all kind of have a similar body design. But you get all the different uh, uh, orders and families starting to appear in the Ordovician and you get a lot of them. So to me, uh, the Ordovician is the golden age of trilobites. The climate was warm and the level of oxygen was rising since the first plants began to colonize the surface. Unfortunately, this advantage had its consequences later. At the end of our division, the percentage of oxygen became greater than that of carbon dioxide. Suddenly, the planet cooled down. At the same time, by movements of plate tectonics, the supercontinent Gondwana reached the south pole of the planet. All these together caused glaciers to form over Gondwana, retreating the sea level and eliminating life near the coasts. In this mass extinction, 85% of life was eliminated. Two orders of trilobites became extinct, Agnosida and Picoparida. From the beginning of the Silurian until the end of the Devonian, things changed again for the trilobites. A new thread had reached the oceans. The first fish with jaws changed everything. Placoderms, named for the plates that warp their heads and necks, developed jaws made of sharp bone. Their two knives cut their prey like scissors. In many trilobite fossils, the great fights that once occurred are recorded. In the case of the fish, the trilobite rolled up to protect its soft parts, and that was fine until the fish came along. For them, this rolled up ball was fine. You just gobbled the whole thing up. So if you were a trilobite, it was a tough world. A rolled up trilobite could have enough harness to resist the yas. Maybe that made the flexicolumine species so abundant. Anyway, this fatal battle took a victim. Killed the last species representing of the order Asaphida, Trinucleoida. In addition, comparing the numbers of families found in the ore division to the amounts found in the Silurian, the numbers are reduced to more than half. The battle continued until the end of the Devonian and only left six remaining orders Arpetida, Proetida, Phacopida, Lichida, Odontopleurida, and Corinexochida. Which of these orders survived to the next mass extinction? Um, and one of the interesting things about trilobite evolution um, is that. Uh, the, the form uh, that was the longest lived, um, meaning the form that had the longest geological history, um, are forms that uh, really exist uh, from early in trilobite evolutionary history right the way till the very end 
uh, to 251 million years. Um, and the forms that, that survived um, of these in the uh, five pictures here is the Proetids, which is the second. Um, and the overall body plan um, of the Proetids is a plan that has representatives in the early part of the Cambrian. But this basic uh, body form um, of that trilobite is one that persists right the way through their evolutionary history and is probably related to um, a, a lifestyle, life habit um, that uh, trilobites very successfully occupied. And that some of these other forms, especially like those spiny odontoplorids at the end, or uh, number five, or the harpetidids um, with the, the big brim around the front, these are very specialized forms, and they may have been really well adapted to specific environments that pertained when these animals were in existence. But they, um, uh, uh, when conditions changed, um, those specific adaptions, uh, adaptations became uh, less, less uh, useful, um, and this kind of generalized form survived. The last survivor of the trilobites in the Permian was the reincarnation of the classic design. And so this trilobite has a very um, uh, a morphology that is found throughout almost all of trilobite evolutionary history. It's probably, uh, if we look at it, um, what can we say about its, uh, its habitat and, uh, and its likely life habits? Well, as you can see, the, um, the, the trilobite is divided into head region at the front and then these segments in the middle, the thoracic segments that have joints at both the front and the back, and that allows it to wrap up. And then uh, the back of the trunk region then is a plate made of lots of segments that are fused together. And uh, uh, if that animal was provoked in some way, it has the facility to roll up like a pill bug, placing the um, base of its tail, the uh, gidium as it's called, the back region, under the underside of the head region at the front and wrap up in a, in a nice little ball. And these animals did that um, uh, very effectively. Uh, now, the central part of the head um, to its uh, sides, there's two little bean-like structures on either side, um, and those are the eyes. So this is an animal with eyes, but the eyes are not on the edge of the head. They're, um, they're um, on the um, uh, upper part uh, of the, the platform next to that central division, which is the stomach capsule. And that means that the trilobite's eyes are not looking underneath. They're looking up and forward uh, and outwards, but they're not looking downwards. So what we can infer from that is that this is an animal that was, when it was looking, it was looking uh, uh, along horizontally and upwards. So this isn't an animal that was likely needing to look down. There are some trilobites with eyes that are on the edge, so they look down as well as up. So why would you not want to look down? Why would the trilobite, um, why would it be not advantageous to uh, have eyes that could look down? Well, if you're, uh, sitting on the seafloor or burrowing into the seafloor, that is a good reason because there's no light that's going to be coming from that direction and therefore there's no point to, to, to look in that direction. So this is a trilobite that probably lived um, uh, at the seafloor or even burrowed uh, uh, shallowly into the uh, uh, seafloor and, and, uh, and down at, at shallow levels. Um, so those are things that we can say about it. It's quite streamlined. Its, um, uh, its head and its, its tail kind of match so it can wrap up in a, in a nice ball. That trilobite had the power to reestablish the abundance and lost ground little by little. But life did not give a second chance. In what is now Siberia, a series of volcanic eruptions floated the atmosphere with ash, blocking sunlight and freezing the earth quickly. Then the amount of carbon raised the temperature by 5% at the sea. The heat was enough to activate the methane in the rock, increasing the temperature even more. All this together eliminated 92% of marine life and the last of the trilobites. 500 million years have passed since their appearance and 250 since they left. In total, there are 270 million years of existence.
of a phylum that practically invented all lifestyles at the sea. They left but their essence is still reincarnated in every animal that follows their steps. Our knowledge is still incomplete. Fossils alone only leave us with more questions about their existence. Will any of them still exist somewhere in the deeps?